Coming up next on Backstage at the Doudna, we sit down with Charleston native and EIU alum, Charlotte Martin. We'll learn more about her journey from college grad to recording artist and the ups and downs along the way. That's all coming up on this edition of Backstage at the Doudna, so don't go away. Welcome to Backstage at the Doudna. I'm Dwight Vaught, the director of the Doudna. It's a pleasure to be in the Black Box Theater here at the Doudna Fine Arts Center, and we are with three very special guests. I guess it takes three to make one, uh, because we're here mainly for our headliner, Charlotte Martin, who is uh, providing a concert for us, but we're also with her husband, Ken Andrews, and Lisa Lombardo, who is her agent. We also don't get a chance to talk to some of the people who make the, the behind the scenes types of things. Oftentimes we just talk with the artists directly. Uh, but it's a pleasure to have everybody here because this gives us, you can give us the real skinny on Charlotte. You know, the Charlotte, the early years, mm -hmm. <laughs> Charlotte, the, the current and everything else. But we'll, we'll talk with Charlotte in just a minute. But first we'll introduce Lisa and Ken uh, and we'll get some of this before we, we get to the focus of why we're here. And that is Charlotte's performance here at the Doudna. So Ken, you met Charlotte, you, you are a musician and been a member of various bands and you met Charlotte as you were working with her on some music and producing some some albums, is that correct? Uh, that was the excuse I used to meet her, basically. <laughs> oh, so you already had your <laughs> To get her out. phone number, actually. <laughs> we, no, we met, she stopped by a studio that I was mixing a record at, and I, um, that's where we initially met, and then I wanted to get her phone number after that, so I called her manager and said, hey, I'm a producer, I'm interested in working with Charlotte Martin. I hadn't even heard of music yet. <laughs> And, uh, nice, that's smooth. Yeah. That's really smooth. But so, yeah, it sort of started out more as a, as a, you know, dating thing. And then we actually grew into working together. We actually tried to avoid that early on in the relationship because we thought it might be weird. Um, but then it just kind of happened, basically. I started doing some demos for her. And then her, the label eventually heard those and said, hey, these are the best demos Charlotte's done. Who did these? And somebody said, it's the boyfriend. <laughs> 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 and so they hired me to do, produce her first album on RCA. And since then, we've been kind of a, a team working on her records, all of her records since then. And there's been a few. Okay. This, this new one is the... Okay. Fifth full okay. length, I think. Fifth full length. When you first heard her music and became captivated by what she was producing as an artist, mm -hmm. what, what did you what did you think in your head? What is this? What does this sound like? What is who who is this artist? Mm -hmm. Charlotte. Yeah. Uh, well, early on, it was it was kind of more about her music was uh, very difficult, uh, challenging musical stuff to play on piano and sing, and you know, it, and she was uh, kind of just out of college here so she had all these chops and her shows were really crazy I mean, it was just like what what is this girl doing like it was um, and that's why that's why she got signed because people were just kind of like at her shows like who is this girl that can play this kind of virtuosic style of rock and write all these crazy songs and the lyrics were interesting and funny sometimes and um, uh, it's, I don't know, we've kind of evolved mm -hmm. stylistically mm -hmm. over the years. Yeah. It's definitely changed. She's the kind of artist, though, that she has such an identifiable voice, like a literal voice, like her actual singing voice, but her, her writing voice is um, very unique and it's very identifiable, if you know it, and it can withstand uh, a lot of different approaches production wise and genre wise so she's done everything from full rock band drums electric guitar bass to just her and a piano to uh, more kind of electronic stuff really kind of her her abilities kind of give us the freedom to do whatever we want in the studio presentation wise So 
Lisa, let's talk to you about the evolution of because Charlotte said yesterday that uh, she met you 17 years ago. I don't know, 10. 12. 10. 13. 12. 12. Oh, okay. 12. Somewhere around there. Somewhere between, there. 10 12, 17, you know, yeah. between 10 and 20. 12, 17, you know. Yeah. Between 10 and 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> You've known each other for a long time. Long time. We lost count. How did, how did you come to know her and then become involved with working with her? Did you answer an ad? Did she put out an ad, you know, looking actually, for an agent yeah, to make was, me rich she and was famous? She or? was looking for someone on Craigslist. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, I actually received her first uh, EP, in parentheses, a press kit in the mail. And I saw that Ken had produced it. I saw this beautiful girl on the cover. I popped it in. And first song in, I called and asked for an interview. Um, and that was how we first met, was that first, that first interview. And I didn't even make through the first song. I knew she was very, very special. Right. Um, and she was someone I wanted to be on board with for the long run. <laughs> oh, don't cry. <laughs> oh, don't cry. <laughs> we don't talk about it a lot because it's emotional. It but, emotional. But, I mean, to be, you know, the, the, the EP in parentheses was four songs, but halfway through the first song, you just, you knew. She, she's, mm. like Ken said, she's unique. And uh, it's a train you have to be on. It's a ride you want to be on for, for the long haul. Sometimes it's the crazy train. But, but yeah. it's worth it. <laughs> the crazy, the good, the hard, the bad, the tears, the releases, the shows, the fans. Every piece of it's worth it when, we, when you have a team like ours. You stop. left Eastern Illinois and you studied opera uh -huh. here. <laughs> Did you think this was the path you were on? Was this the path you started on? Did you sort of take some divergent paths? T tell us a little bit about what happened once you left Eastern and this so-called meteoric rise that's brought you to where you're at. Well, I left with about $30,000. My uncle had passed away and my parents bought me a Saturn and drove it with my 30 grand to Hollywood and I had one contact from someone I had never met. I played a show in Milwaukee and Neil Diamond's monitor engineer happened to be drinking in the lounge I was playing at. And he came up to me and gave me his card. It was crazy creepy, but I kept it. And then I called him a couple months later and said, hey, I tried to go to Nashville. Everyone thinks I'm nuts there. They just didn't know what to do with me musically. They were like. So um, I called him, he's like, you should meet my friend Bernie. So I never met Bernie, but I decided, like, it was a very quick decision that I was going to move to L.A. So I did it, moved into an apartment. My mom still thinks she was on drugs when she took me and left me there, 23 <laughs> years old. And I call this guy up and say, hi, you know, basically I got your number from Greg, da-da-da-da-da. So I go by play for him. And they keep me busy for, like, the first year. And I don't have a job because I have that money. So on the days I didn't go record with these guys, they thought I was good enough to record. They charged me for it, though. So on the days that I wasn't there... Uh, Isn't it supposed to work the other way? I know, right. And the days I wasn't there, I was holed up in this little apartment writing by myself all day long. Hours and hours and hours. And I got a big mirror, and I started watching myself in front of the mirror. And I can't... I mean, hours. And it was very lonely, and I kept watching my money just drain away, you know, and I, several times I called my mom in tears like, I got to come home, I can't do this. I don't know how it's going to happen. I have no idea. And I just knew that I needed to get money somehow. And if I could get my foot in the door, then I'd have the, the stressful job of trying to maintain a career in music. And uh, it was just like, kind of like opportunity met lots of hard work. And uh, I decided about four or five months before I ran out of money, I, I needed to do a show. I just needed to do a show. So my girlfriend booked the show at this was strip club, not anymore. She wore a very low cut sh shirt to book my show. No one knew who I was. I mean, she like had the full, like, hi, you wanna book my friend? And so <laughs> gave him like a cassette. I didn't even have a demo. I think they gave her, she gave him a cassette. A cassette. Uh -huh. And then my neighbor who worked at um, an advertising agency made these really nice cards. And so my friend, the boobs, fired it and got it pretty much full the show full. 
And so after being out there for a year, I'd, I'd met a few people. I met a scout that worked at Interscope. I invited who I had met and knew. And from that show, the scout guy quit his job at Interscope and decided he was going to manage me. And then he went in with another manager like a week later, played for them. And then all of a sudden, like overnight, I'm showcasing for every label in town, like overnight. And then it really gets stressful. <laughs> so, Ken, were these the crazy shows that, that no, you, you were talking no, about? No, I didn't. Or? I hadn't met her yet. I met her after she signed with RCA. So, so, the, so there was a whole couple year. of year, yeah, yeah, there was one year. Yeah, one year in there um, where she was working with that management team mm -hmm. and getting her deal. I, I kind of met her when she was in, in uh, what do we call it, label, label limbo, where they were, they had signed her, they knew she was really talented, but they w weren't sure what direction to take with her production and create creatively, like how to record her and present her to the world, basically. And so they basically just kind of floundered there for a few years. Yeah. Um, and, and then there was, uh, the label went through an, an, uh, uh, several upheavals where it, they changed president and then the new president came in and changed the whole staff. Mm. Usually when that happens, they clear out rosters, clear out the roster to um, make room for new signings. And, you know, if they haven't ever released an artist that's under contract, they usually drop you, they usually drop you because they just kind of want to start fresh. But right. she would she would get evaluated. They would somebody, a new A and R person, would come and say, "Okay, I right need to me. evaluate you, and tell, and then tell my boss that I'm going to drop you, basically." But every time they would be like, "You're amazing! Like, why aren't we releasing you? And you should be like on MTV right now." Blah blah blah. So that sort of kept happening for a while, and then she finally, they finally gave. Uh, me basically the go-ahead to record her after they heard a couple demos that I had produced. Well, Ashley came in. Yeah, a new, a new a the third, person third who guy. Yeah, he got it. Yeah, he got it, and uh, he got it creatively for sure. Mm -hmm. And finally, green lighted her to make her record. We made the record, and then once you make your record at a major label, then you have the whole next step up trying to get the label interested in actually releasing your record and promoting it. Yeah. Was getting it put out. They actually, most major labels make a few, make a solid percentage of records they never release. Uh, most people don't really realize that, but once you get signed, it's like the real work starts, basically. Was it because she was still relatively a new name? Was it because they didn't know how to categorize you, Charlotte? And which, which Everyone was scared. Which category are we going to put this in to no. try to grab a hook in the audience? Well, go, they, they kind of envisioned her as pop, um, so there was... The, the, the RCA record was, was kind of pop. It had a lot of depth, though. So, um, but the thing of it is, from their point of view, if you're going to actually really go for it and market a pop artist, it's a multi-million dollar proposition. Yeah. So, you know, they basically get a bunch of artists with records done, and they're like, and they have so many chips, right? And, you know, millions of dollar chips, basically. And where are they going to put them? And it just so happened that that year, they decided to put, in, in terms of females, they kind of went with Alicia Keys. Yeah. And then it was like, okay, they still believed in her artistically, but, I mean, and they did release the record, but they did not promote it at all. No, they gave me tour support, because I was good live. They gave me lots of tour support for a couple of years. And that, at least, is that and the f several opening slots I got are partly one of the main reasons I still work. Yeah, they paid. They there did was, pay some money. There was they kind of ga they they gave some tour support money that allowed her to go out and build a small fan base before the actual album full came album out. came out. But then they didn't actually do anything. So then we came to the point where the, or they they said, look, we blew it on this record. We still believe in you. Do you want to stay on the label, and do or record. do you want to? We'll let you go with the nice severance package, basically. I took the severance. She took the severance. Bought a house, went on tour. And we, <laughs> luckily, during that time, had engaged with the fans. I mean, this was really before social media, but we had been great about making sure we could connect to those fans through snail mail, email. Um, so we had, that when, when we made that decision to move, we were still able to direct one-on-one -on -one market to those fans. Mm -hmm. um, which I think made all the difference when 
oh, yeah. you know, in making that decision to leave RCA. And that's amazing to understand that in the, the days before social media, you yes. could actually gain an audience with snail mail. And I think it was almost yeah. easier. You know why? Yes. Because back then you didn't have everyone and their dog in a band that could upload it to YouTube. There's kind of a sea of people that, I don't know, it's not their best suit to do music. I mean, and how do you tell people that? And now with the way digital is and how everybody can buy Pro Tools, you know, or Logic at a very reasonable price, anybody can be in a band and make a record. And back then that was right before that started. So the only way you really got out there is if you were good and someone helped you get out there, you know? And they did. I mean, I d had some press and I had some good tours and it was like, w it would have been great if it was more, but it was just enough to like, once we left the label, we were already on the road in a few months. Like yes. I had another release, like it was just like bam, bam. We, we released an EP like four months yeah. after that. Looking at your discography, it's you know, every year, year and a half, two mm -hmm. years, Something is you know, something's put out, whether it's an EP or a full mm -hmm. length. Um, so your last one was 2012. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. My calendar is correct. It's about time, right? Yes, it is mm -hmm. about time. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get to that, now the two of you, you've obviously seen her live. You saw her live early on. Mm -hmm. um, what what does Charlotte do live that really draws people in? Not just the artistic strength, her writing ability, and all of those kinds of things, but what is her persona that that you think that this this woman has? It's, mm. it's, it's well, amazing. it's pretty hard to describe, but she's just one of those artists that when they get on stage and start singing, everyone just focuses. You know, it's just one of the, I've been to a lot of showcases where a band gets up there and they start doing their thing and pe pe people watch the first song and then when the second song starts, everyone goes to the bar and gets a drink and starts talking. That doesn't happen at her shows. It's very weird. She just has that kind of thing that, I don't know, it's very personal. It's very, um, it's very direct. You feel like she's singing to you or she makes eye contact with everyone in the room. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a definitely, uh, I've seen her do that exact same thing too in a small space like this with a few hundred people right. and in front of like 8,000 people. You write all of your own things? Have you ever done anybody else's material? You pretty much. I did covers. I did a covers record. Um, I, I, I just actually I didn't learn any for this run. I usually learn one new one, and, you know, surprise people. But I have a new record, so I have to actually learn how to play it. And I think that's probably the dual strength. You've got strong material. You've got a, a strong person who can present it in the way that she means it. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have to worry about it not being authentic. I mean, it really, it really is, as I would guess, that just comes right out of you mm -hmm. because you wrote it, you live it. Is, it. is it going to be easier or more difficult to play in a hometown for people who have known you since the proverbial, you know, this tall? As well as some new audiences. We won't say everybody here will, will know you. Uh, but uh, what, what do you hope to bring to this particular audience that might be different from an audience which you don't have a personal necessarily a personal connection to mm, I'm a little nervous Jerry Daniels is gonna be here that's my coach Your from teacher? college yes yeah I'm a little Your nervous. opera instructor yes yes um, I'm a little are you nervous. gonna slip a little opera in there just maybe just for him you know I put a little ditty on <laughs> a little <laughs> operatic ditty on Stramata yes and he laughed at me so I decided <laughs> <not to. laughs> and he always used to make fun of my Joyman, yeah, and my French is pretty bad, but um, yeah, he laughed. Yeah, the fans um, liked it though. They liked it because <laughs> it was I very can. new for them. It was a very new experience. Uh, I've had, had a gl nice glass of wine and thought, let's just do a little opera thing. They'll love it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> let's do it in German. <laughs> let's just let's just prove that I actually went there and got that degree. <laughs> let's just see if I can do it. That was kind of hard. I was a coloratura. No, things have changed. Too many smoky bars. I don't smoke. <laughs> but so now you're married. You have two kids. Mm -hmm. Your artistic person is evolving. 
um, your management. What, what happens in a management as you work with an artist over the years? Do the two of you get together and say, do you really have a long-term dream and plan? You're obviously looking at the short term, let's get these gigs, let's do this tour, let's cut this album. But, but what happens when an artist and, and management work together for the, for the long term? You always mm -hmm. want to have your three-month plan, but you also need your five-year plan. Where, yeah. do, where do we want to be five years from now? Um, so that you're always working towards that and always challenging the management team, the artists, the fans, making sure everyone's on the same page. So it's, it's really a, a balance of looking at that short term, you know, always having your three-month plan, always looking at it actively and changing it, and then, of course, building out your five-year plan. Are and we, we discussed it. Yeah, we discussed it. Are we going to have another record in in another two years? Or is it going to be a DVD next time? Is it going to be a run of shows? Is it going to be a live recording? So we always have the discussion on the table as a group, mm -hmm. actively. Um, it's the only way to keep, to keep things engaged, keep things moving and, and fresh. Charlotte, do you prefer to do solo shows or do you, uh, I'm not, obviously there's a different energy when you're working with a lot of other musicians, but then there's an intimacy when you're doing I prefer sort of solo, so. even though I love Fernando. I had a drummer that I brought out with one of my really electronic records, and it was me with lots of synthesizers and him. The guy's 6'5", so when he would sit down, <laughs> I would stand up and we'd be the same height. <laughs> uh, and he is like, exactly. literally, literally, <laughs> um, I'm 5'1". Um, and he was really lovely to tour with and lovely to play with, but I have more control over myself when it's just myself, you know. There's a tendency, even with, like the louder it gets, the more I push, and if I push, then I lose where I am, and then if I, you know, it, it's very, what's the word, it's very, there's a balance to the voice, to the piano, to the synth, and how I'm going to deliver it. And I, I think I said this in that interview, um, you know, Jerry told me years ago when I was wanting to be an opera singer and all this, he's like, you know, you're not going to mature until you're, 30, you're in your 30s. And I'm like 21, and I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I think I think I, I think I did the Met auditions once, the regional ones, and I was the youngest one. And I heard some of the singers, and they were way better, and they were louder, and it was just more focused. And now, you know, I'm in my 30s. I've had a couple kids. I've had some really intense life experiences in the last few years, and so it's different now. I'm able to focus, and I couldn't even do that when I was touring nine months out of a year where I was just playing and playing and playing. I was still terrified to be on stage. I know, it, I mean, I'm more comfortable now than I was back then. And uh, so hopefully tonight I'll be focused. So tonight uh, at this show it'll be keyboards in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. when, um, when you perform, do you tailor each show to the audience? Mm -hmm. Do you have a set, a set list that you're going to use? Is it new material? Is it some of the older? The older things, a good mix. What, what can mix. we expect? It's a mix. I try to touch every project a little bit, um, I tr I tr especially at something like this. Like Chicago will be different because I was there on needles and I was there on stromata and I was there on veins and I was there on DVDs and this one, you know, I've never been here. So I got to do a little bit from from everything and all the sets are different, which makes it very difficult for me. So there are students here who are now in, in your shoes as you were a number of years ago, studying opera, mm -hmm. studying voice, wanting to sort of mold their own career. Any bits of advice that you can give them other than leaving a Saturn with $30,000 and seeing where it takes you? That's what I did. That's exactly what I did. Um, <coughs> Ken's always had really good advice for me about stuff like that. He's always like... Well, I know a lot, a lot of people in the business and there is no unifying story. Everybody has a totally unique story. Some people go to school, some people don't. Some people start by driving a, a tr equipment truck and then they're like a roadie and then they're... Like Billy Howard. Huh? Yeah. I, he was a guitar tech and now he's a perfect circle. It's just like... Yeah, he, went, he literally went from a uh, guitar tech to like, you know, sold out 10,000 people shows overnight but it was I mean not to him it wasn't overnight because the whole time he was being a guitar tech he was writing that first record yeah 
working on his sounds, working, <laughs> developing the sound for what would become his band. See, that's the advice, though, because that's what I did, to constantly work, constantly. I, I, I could not have done it with children. I've slowed way down now that I've had kids, and that's okay. But back in those early years, man, lots of I, hours. I would, I would say, if there is one piece of advice, it's very difficult and, and can't be really like mentally challenging business. There's a, there's a lot of setbacks sometimes, a lot, a lot of, rejection. of disappointments, rejections. If you don't love the process of writing or performing or whatever it is, you might want to think about something else because <laughs> it can get hard. very difficult. Um, if you have, if you st can still sit down and pick up your instrument and at least enjoy that, and that will get you through the tough times. Well, we're, we're very glad that you're here, that you'll be doing the show for us, the hometown crowd. We're very much looking forward to it. We have been for a long time. We're so pleased that you brought Ken, your husband, audio engineer, videographer, babysitter, you know, what, whatever other roles he, he plays. Mm -hmm. Rock star in his own right. And Lisa, your support arm on the other side. Uh, that, that's really special for us to have all of those, those people here to be able to support you. Special for us, too. I think this is cool because it's the first time we've all three. This is like it. And yeah, it's the first time. This is it. Like the you power. have to have a strong team. You have to believe in each other and lean on each other. You really do. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's part of the success. If you want to do it, you have to find the team members that are going to work well together. Well, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for taking the Thank time. You. Best of luck. Thanks, Thanks. Thank you.